welcome to the Center for Migration Studies webinar and discussion of the forthcoming report, Social Determinants of Immigrants' Health in New York City, a study of six neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens. We're really grateful you can join us this afternoon. Before we get started, I'm gonna go over a couple of housekeeping items just so you know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the panel, you can submit a question for the speakers. To do so, click, up, click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window and type in your question. We're gonna to turn to audience questions at the end of the event. And given the large number of participants on today's call, we will be able to get to some of your questions, but perhaps not all of them. However, you can contact CMS with any additional questions after the event. So this is going to last around an hour and it will be recorded. And we will share the recording of this webinar with you all and with all the registrants after the event. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to the moderator of today's event, CMS's Publications and Events Manager, Melissa Katsouris. Thank you, Emma. And thank you all for joining us for a presentation on a very important report titled Social Determinants of Immigrants' Health in New York City, a study of six neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens. This report will be available on CMS's website very soon. The report examines the social determinants of immigrants' health in six neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens and highlights several factors that likely contribute to the health gap between U.S.-born and immigrant residents in these neighborhoods. The study also describes steps that can be taken to close this gap. The study was originally conceptualized in 2020 by Daniela Alulema, CMS's former director of programs, and Donald Kerwin, CMS's executive director. CMS would like to thank the Mother Cabrini Health Foundation that made this study possible with its generous support. Particularly, we'd like to thank Sapna Shah from the foundation for her guidance on this project. We'd like to thank our advisory group of experts who provided guidance throughout this study and reviewed the report. We'd also like to acknowledge all the people and organizations that assisted our research team with data collection and CMS's research and production teams for their diligent work on this report. Most importantly, we'd like to thank all the immigrants who participated in this study and shared their information, experiences, and ideas with CMS's research team. Today, the authors of the report, Vicki Virgin and Jacqueline Pavillon, will provide an overview of the findings, research methodology, and policy recommendations from this study. Then we'll hear remarks from, and discussion from our guest speakers, starting with Sally Finley, who is an emeritus professor of population and family health at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University Medical Center, Rishi Sood, the Executive Director of Healthcare Access and Policy at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Becca Telzak, the Deputy Director of Make the Road New York. After their remarks, we will answer questions from the audience, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time in the Q&A box. We'll start with Vicki Virgin now who will speak particularly about the context of the social and health situation for immigrants in these six neighborhoods studied and the data findings of the report. So Vicki, please go ahead. Thank you, Melissa. It's, it's very nice to be here with everyone today. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about how the report that's being released today is this, it's the second study that CMS has done on the health of immigrants in Brooklyn and Queens. The first study, Mapping Key De Determinants of Immigrants' Health in Brooklyn and Queens was released last year by CMS. It was in that research that we identified neighborhoods where immigrants were most at risk of poor health outcomes. Oh, um, would you put my first slide up, Emma? Great, thank you. Okay, so um, we ranked the neighborhoods uh, using the following indicators, poverty, limited English proficiency, education level, immigration status, living in overcrowded households, and lack of health insurance. Um, these six neighborhoods on this map were identified as having immigrants that, the, that were the most vulnerable. So in Brooklyn, starting down at the bottom, you see Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, Southern Brooklyn, and then moving up is Sunset Park and Windsor Terrace, and then Bushwick, that little skinny 
rectangular type looking neighborhood. And those were the three neighborhoods in, in Brooklyn. Uh, in Queens, Flushing off to the right was one Flushing, Whitestone and Murray Hill. And then um, Jackson Heights and North Corona and Elmhurst and South Corona. All those three neighborhoods are all kind of contiguous. So neighborhoods, let me just also clarify, neighborhoods in this study are analogous to the New York City's community districts. Um, and there's a link in, there's gonna be a link in the chat uh, on this that, that will refer back to this study that, that was released last year that uh, identified these neighborhoods. So what I'm going to do now is to present some context for the neighborhoods that, that are in the study. And after that, I'm going to turn it over to Jacqueline, who's going to report on findings from surveys and interviews that CMS conducted with immigrants and healthcare providers, allowing for a deeper dive into these neighborhoods. Okay, next slide. This slide shows the six neighborhoods. Um, by, by the immigration status, immigration status of their uh, population. The top three pies are the neighborhoods in Brooklyn and the bottom row are the, are the neighborhoods in Queens. So you can see by looking at the top, the blue pie, the blue slice is uh, US born citizens. And Brooklyn seems has larger shares of US born citizens than, than Queens does in general in these neighborhoods. And Queens have larger shares of, uh, in, in general, of naturalized citizens, the orange slice. And um, the two neighborhoods with the largest share of foreign born were Elmhurst and South Corona and Jackson Heights and, and North Co Corona. Both of these neighborhoods had over 60% of their neighborhoods were, were made up of immigrants. Jackson Heights also had the largest share of undocumented immigrants. That's the green slice. Okay, next slide. This slide shows, again, the six neighborhoods by the region of origin or the region of birth, so where the immigrants are coming from into these six neighborhoods, and a quick note about how we define the region of origin. We divide Central and South America region into Hispanic and non-Hispanic. Uh, we do this to make the distinction to highlight the contribution of the West Indian community to New York City. Uh, for example, the non-Hispanic countries of Central and South America include, among others, Jamaica, Trinidad, Haiti, and Guyana. And then the Hispanic countries of South and Central America include the Central American countries and the South American countries, with the exception of Guyana. And North America primarily uh, represents Mexico. So looking at this, the first takeaway is how diverse each one of these neighborhoods is and how widely di their diversity um, varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. Starting with um, Bay Ridge Diker Heights, 50, while 50% 50 of this neighborhood is, um, has immigrants that come from South and East Asia, this neighborhood had the largest share of immigrants from Africa. That's the dark blue slice at the very, very bottom of these bars. Uh, moving over to, to Bushwick, over two thirds of this neighborhood is comprised of immigrants coming from Mexico, the top green, and the Hispanic countries of South and Central America, primarily the Dominican Republic and Ecuador. Sunset Park has 50% of their immigrants coming from South and East Asia, and another 40% from Mexico and the Hispanic countries of Central and South America. Moving into Queens, Elmhurst, has equal shares of immigrants coming from the South and East Asia and the Hispanic countries of Central and South America. Flushing probably stands out the most. 75% of this neighborhood is made up of immigrants who come from South and East Asia. This neighborhood has one of the largest con concentrations of Asians in the whole city. And last, Jackson Heights and North Corona, the majority of immigrants in this neighborhood come from um, Ecuador, Dominican Republic, Colombia and Mexico. Next slide, please. Um, these data come from New York City's um, Community Health Survey, and it compares selected health determinants. Uh, it compares the U.S. born to the native, the U.S. born to the foreign born. 
Uh, you can see that foreign born residents in general have poor health and less access to health care. So just walking down this chart, um, they're, uh, foreign born are less likely to have health insurance. Uh, I'm, there's gonna be a, a slide, another slide about this later. More immigrants reported poor physical health. They were less likely to have a personal care provider, were more likely to ex experience food insecurity and were less likely to receive help for mental health issues. Well, on the other hand, um, the foreign born were less likely to have reported having asthma compared to the US born. Next slide. This slide shows the share of the population without health insurance from 2010 to 2019. And it shows it for all of the different legal statuses and citizenship statuses. So the share, as you can see, uh, without health insurance has declined over time particularly after the enactment of the American Affordable Care Act in 2014. This decline holds for all of the groups, regardless of immigration status. The US, which is the orange um, bottom line, dropped by half their share from 9% to 4%. And there was a similar trend for naturalized citizens. The undocumented were most likely to be uninsured 44% in 2019, but this group also experienced the largest drop from 65% uninsured in 2010. Next slide. Okay, next we look at educational attainment and how that affects access to having, whether or not you have health insurance. This chart is for the total foreign born. Um, and it shows that regardless of immigration status, the lower the level of education one has, the less likely you are to have health insurance. So this first set of bars to the left shows that 19% um, of, of the total foreign born with less than a ninth grade education has health insurance compared to eight, just 8% 8 for those with a bachelor's degree or higher. This is particularly pronounced for the undocumented where over two thirds of those with the ninth grade or less education had no health insurance compared to 25% for those with a bachelor's degree or higher. Next slide. Okay, so this now we're gonna show um, the median annual median earnings again for the six neighborhoods and by immigration and citizenship status. Overall at first glance, well, no, I'm actually, I'm going to talk about Elmhurst and South Corona first, because that neighborhood's a little bit of an outlier. In overall, this neighborhood had the lowest earnings, and the gaps between the different statuses were the smallest. But other than this neighborhood, this chart shows the importance of legal status when it comes to earnings. Citizens, both U.S. born and naturalized, have higher earnings than non-citizen workers. Earnings for legal non-citizens and undocumented immigrants workers ranged from 21,000 to about 27,000. Bay Ridge had the highest median earnings for both US born and naturalized citizens. And that's uh, it for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Jacqueline now so she can discuss the other findings from the report. Thanks, Ricky. Um, could you please put up my slides next, Emma? <clears throat> so for this report, um, as Vicki mentioned, we took on a, a, a wild endeavor of surveying nearly 500 immigrants across these six neighborhoods that were identified as most at risk, as well as 24 service providers that work with those immigrant communities. Um, next slide, please, Emma. Um, in this report, uh, we kind of identified eight areas that are the social determinants of health that are affecting immigrants' access to health across the neighborhood. So in the findings of this report, uh, we focus on income and poverty, uh, occupation and work conditions in which immigrants are working, education level immigrants, uh, limited English proficiency, overcrowding, food insecurity, as well as uh, neighborhoods, health, safety, and location, and discrimination and lack of representation. Next slide, please. So 
so for the data collection for this project, again, we used an online survey of 492 immigrants that was administered in Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, Mandarin, um, English, Korean, and Spanish. Uh, we administered this survey uh, through social media, through community health clinics, found flyers using a QR code, working with community-based organizations to get the word out, uh, email blasts, you name it. Um, and in the end, we uh, came across this, um, this distribution of immigrant respondents. Uh, there was a question in the chat, where is um, the Middle East located? Uh, that would be here in East and South Asia. Uh, we recognize these naming conventions are not perfect. And so we do in the annex of the forthcoming report have uh, where all of the different countries are located by region of origin. So Middle East is included in East and South Asia. Um, so uh, we uh, surveyed all of these immigrant groups as well as service providers that included both community health clinics, hospital networks, insurance providers, community-based organizations. And we also con convened one focus group to just hear a more qualitative voice from, from immigrants across these six neighborhoods. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is just a general overview across the whole sample. And this is the share of respondents who reported needing access to healthcare um, in the previous uh, 12 months before they took the survey, but did not receive it for whatever reason um, by type of healthcare. So over a third of people reported needing access to a general practitioner over the previous, in the previous year, um, but not accessing it. And then we went forward to ask them why they did not access healthcare and what were the barriers preventing them from it. Um, and, and you know, more than 10% reported not re taking over the counter drugs, dentist, uh, or seeing a specialist doctor, et cetera. So going down the line. Um, and what we found, uh, was that the, the reasons that immigrants were saying that they didn't receive health care was quite different than what service providers and those who worked with immigrants were saying were the reasons, the barriers to health care. Next slide, please. So what immigrants were saying as uh, barriers to health care and mental health care. Uh, so let's start on, on the left here. So the barriers, the top, uh, immigrants were asked to rank the reasons that they didn't receive health care or list the reasons um, that were preventing them from receiving that needed health care if they did it within the last 12 months but needed it. And the top three reasons that immigrants said they need, did not receive needed health care were lack of insurance, uh, inability to afford the care, and inability to take time off due to work, child care, and other responsibilities. Uh, instead, the top three reasons service providers said that immigrants were not receiving needed health care were language barriers, fear of revealing documentation status, and a, then inability to afford services. Um, so uh, the differences were even larger between what immigrants were saying and service providers were uh, saying in regards to mental health care services. So uh, the, the reasons were relatively similar that immigrants were saying they weren't receiving mental health care services as regard, in regards uh, to, to physical health care services. So immigrants said they were not receiving mental health services because of inability to take time off, again, uh, lack of health insurance and inability to afford services. Uh, instead, service providers were saying that the reason immigrants were not getting mental health services were fear of stigma, cultural reasons, and language barriers. So it, it, it kind of seems that uh, in our findings, uh, service providers may have been overestimating the, the reasons, uh, the cultural reasons that people were not seeking out care, when what we were hearing from immigrants and their responses was more just the inaffordability and lack of insurance uh, coverage. Um, and so I'm we, in the report, delve a little deeper into those reasons and, and where the gaps in coverage are and where some of the direct access programs that New York City services offer can come, come into play. Next slide, please. So we looked at you know, these six neighborhoods and we asked people to just, you know, how is your health in general? And people were able to rank it from very bad to very good. Um, so when we ranked this by neighborhood, you know, uh, the lower the number, the, the worse the average health. So we, we found that people in Elmhurst, South Corona had on average the, the best health care and people in Flushing, White Zone, Murray Hill had the, the worst average self-reported health. Um, excuse me, the, the, the people in Elmhurst, South Corona had the best health 
and people in Flushing, White, Sunbury Hill had the, the worst self-reported health. Um, I, I will mention that in this report, um, we do weight all of our analysis by nationality. Um, so uh, we don't. We want to make sure that all of our, our results are representative by nationality, which will also account for some of the um, discrepancy in survey responses by, by neighborhood as well. Um, so people in Flushing Whitestone were just reporting just over fair as their average self-reported health. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we asked people about their their food food uh, consumption patterns. So uh, on the, the left here, you'll see a graph by neighborhood. We asked people uh, to, if they had a grocery store that sells fresh food within one mile of their home or what is typically known as a food desert. So in um, Bay Ridge Diker Heights, 91% of people said they did. And in Jackson Heights, North Corona, only 64% of people could say the same. So Bushwick and North Bushwick and Jackson Heights, North Corona seem to be more typical of food deserts. Um, and one in four immigrants uh, in the whole sample said they went without eating in the last month at least once due to a lack of resources, which is huge. Um, and, and 10 out of 24 service providers, again, the discrepancy between what service providers are saying and immigrants are saying, said that uh, lack of awareness about healthy food options and nine out of 24 service providers said that cultural ideas about nutrition were the were barriers but instead um, among those who said they didn't eat fresh food they ate fresh foods less than three times uh, in the last week 85 percent of them said that cost was the reason they weren't eating fresh produce next slide please so when we look at nationality, we were able to break this down by nationality. Down here at the bottom, Mexicans, people from Hong Kong and uh, Bangladeshi respondents and Indians were those with the worst self-reported health. Um, and then we asked the same question of service providers who are receiving less services than are needed. Um, and the underserved nationalities according to service providers were Mexicans, Bangladeshis, and Pakistani, Chinese, and Indians. So um, it does seem to see, seem to be that those with the worst self-reported health are also those that service providers are saying are the most underserved. So there is a, a match up there of who is not receiving the, the correct services. Next slide, please. Uh, we also asked service providers um, what languages there's a lack of translators for, um, that there's an unmet need for translators for. And there's an overwhelming need for more Spanish translators, ma Mandarin and Bengali. So the same groups that, that are underrepresented and having poor health outcomes, there's also a lack of translators available for those groups according to service providers. Next slide, please. When we, this language barrier um, was a, a problem, but not uh, due to maybe some of the, the services that New York City provides, not as big as a problem as one might have anticipated. Um, uh, respondents with lower medium English proficiency are less likely to have private health insurance coverage, but they were more likely to take up other forms of health insurance than remain uninsured. So you can see they were more likely to take up, um, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, um, Affordable Care Act, um, NYC Care, other forms of health insurance alternatives. So it does seem that uh, that the city has been doing a decent job at, you know, reaching out in regards to providing other language access alternatives. Uh, however, when we did the same breakdown by those with low education level and high education level, um, we saw that the, the share and uninsured raised a lot. So um, it, it does seem that we, while people have with low English proficiency may have been reached, those with low education level, uh, maybe the same isn't true. Next slide, please. Um, discrimination across the whole sample, we asked uh, um, immigrants whether they ever felt discriminated against while seeking health care and for what reason. 39% uh, of immigrants said that they felt discriminated against on the basis of race while seeking health care, which is huge. Um, 26, tw excuse me, 28% said based on the uh, on uh, the basis of nationality and citizenship and 12% based on English proficiency. Uh, there's a quote um, on the right, you can read it, but I'll, 
uh, I won't read it out to you, but I will just say uh, the part in red. People believe they are not receiving the same treatment because they're black as they would have as if they were white. And they do notice uh, they're receiving less quality, less quantity treatment um, because uh, they, they're people of color. And that is in their voice, not mine. This is a direct quote from one of our focus group participants. And he was not the only uh, focus group participant to point this out. Um, uh, these numbers are telling. Uh, people um, uh, across our sample, um, among those who said they needed to see a healthcare professional in the last year but didn't, 17% said fear of discrimination was one of the reasons they let their ailments go untreated. That was more than language. Um, so when, when thinking about how to address these issues, representation is, is, a, is really important among those in leadership positions. Okay, um, and next slide, please. Uh, we asked some people if they had heard of New York City programs, including NYC Care. Um, about a half to a third across the neighborhoods had heard of these NYC um, uh, programs. This would be the New York City's um, uh, Healthcare Alternative Direct Access Program to Healthcare, Mental Health Services, which is now under a different naming convention. Um, and Action NYC through the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, only about a half to a third of immigrants across these neighborhoods had heard of these programs, and um, between a fourth and a fifth were using them. Um, among the uninsured, 27% said they needed health care in the 12, past 12 months but didn't receive it, but um, only 29% of the uninsured had even heard of NYC care. So uh, it indicates that there is still room for awareness raising. Um, it indicates there's more room for funding, uh, including for CBOs who, who are uh, uh, raising awareness about these programs. So uh, next slide, please. This is obviously just the tip of the iceberg of this report. There's a lot more in there that delves in more in depth in the social determinants of health um, for immigrants across these neighborhoods. Here are just a few highlighted policy recommendations. The governor should ensure that the New York State proposed legislation, which includes coverage for all it's enacted, um, this has a, a, a $345 million funding um, budget, which would uh, provide health care coverage for 150,000 low-income New Yorkers who currently cannot access health insurance due to immigration status. Um, the New York City Comptroller Brad Lander estimates this program would provide $710 million annually in economic benefits due to increased life expectancy, labor productivity, and decreased out of pocket due to decreased out-of-pocket costs and less reliance on emergency room visits. Um, and New York City can also, uh, the New York City Council can also pass a pending bill, which could create the Office for Patient Advocate, uh, Office for the Patient Advocate with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, this could address some of those compliance issues that have to do with discrimination. New York City could also fund New York NYC Care fully fund it, including CBOs who are promoting it. And New York City government could invest more in providing health, healthy, fresh food to immigrant New Yorkers across the six neighborhoods. And uh, the city should improve its translation and interpretation services, especially for um, speakers of certain ang Asian languages who are the most likely to report um, discrimination and uh, lack of access to services based on uh, language. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to our guest speakers now. Thank you, Jacqueline. So next we'll hear from Sally Finley um, and she will explain why this report is needed in New York City and provide her perspective on the barriers immigrants face in accessing healthcare and basic services there. So um, I'll turn it over to Sally now. Great, thanks very much. Um, Emma, can you put the slides up for me, please? You know, I'm a retired academic, so I have to have slides. <laughs> um, so CMS has already done a lot of work on looking at the levels of disadvantage that immigrants in New York City experience. And this is just figure one from the report that uh, Vicki Virg and Virgin has just talked about in her opening remarks, mapping key health determinants. So you can see here some of the same things that 
that they've been talking about in the, this study already show that there's a social and economic disadvantage that's experienced and that it's greater for the undocumented and for the legal non-citizens. Next slide, please. And we know that immigrant health is poor, as has also been stated, for than the native born health with the difference narrowing with increased duration of residence that naturalized citizens have health situations closer to native born than other immigrants and access to health insurance is part of the reason that they tend to have poor health outcomes but not the only ones. Um, and immigrant health differentials do vary for specific conditions. Next slide, please. So this is from many different studies, not just the work of the researchers here in New York City, then immigrants do tend to fare better in terms of health. They tend not to be smokers. They have lower blood pressure. As was mentioned already in this report, their asthma prevalence is low, but diabetes prevalence has also tended to be low as well as cardiovascular disease. So in certain thing, areas, they fare better, but it's worse for prevention and management, which then comes back to influencing their general health status, lower on routine and preventive care, lower access to health insurance. Here's, here comes the importance of, of mental health. So that you really can't just have one measure of health. Um, you need to kind of consider the various situations that, that they are confronting um, as they are trying to stay healthy. Next slide, please. So um, when Sergio Matos and I were looking at this whole issue of how community health workers help immigrants stay healthy, we came up with this um, model. And I think the most important thing that I want to point out here is on the left, it's the neighborhood, it's the community. And on the right, it's the immigrant. So that there are different groups of resources. And if you look at the boxes, um, next slide, please. You'll see that the immigrants most likely to not fare well in the face of health threats based on how we think all this intersects are recent arrivals who are not familiar with the system coming from countries with a great cu cultural difference from New York City, especially if there are limited immigrant networks for that group, limited social networks offering information and support, low literacy and limited language abilities, under or unemployed with little money without access to health insurance. And here is where I think some of these studies start to come together, the undocumented and others who fear to access the public health system and insufficient community resources for supporting immigrants in their pursuit of livelihoods and health. So you can see how the context of this study is really important that they're bringing in a big focus on what are the resources to support the immigrants and how do they vary in these communities. Next slide, please. So CMS has already documented underutilization during the Trump administration of benefits for which immigrants are eligible due to fear of possible family separation, detention, deportation, despite efforts which are also documented by the city, by public hospitals, community organizations to facilitate access to these benefits and services. But the earlier study which focused on how fears do influence whether people are getting care or not, didn't focus on the variation in communities. It was a citywide study. Yes, it included Brooklyn and Queens, but it also included many more neighborhoods. So what CMS has been able to do in this study is to focus on the two immigrants that have a high density of immigrant populations and to be able to delve down more deeply into some of those interactions between community and individual characteristics. Next slide, please. So 
So I'm not going to try to cover everything that was in the survey, but I'm going to highlight a few points that I think are important that the study did show. It confirmed many of the previous findings regarding how immigrant status affects access to health care, particularly for the uninsured and those who have not accessed or uh, uh, needed care for cost reasons. And it's very important that they do bring that out as um, Jacqueline just said, you know, that the providers think it's one thing, but when you talk to the immigrants, they really emphasize the cost barriers. They, the report gives a lot more detail on the levels and sources of mental distress, specifically on the experience of dis discrimination and the degree of safety associated with occupations that the immigrants find themselves involved in as they struggle to earn money. Um, the study also details differences in health status and access to health care within specific immigrant communities of Brooklyn and Queens. And I think that's a real um, eye opener to see how in fact it varies um, within Brooklyn, within Queens and within each immigrant group. There, there are some very interesting findings that um, Jacqueline didn't bring out in her presentation just now regarding overcrowding and particularly among the non-citizen and undocumented immigrants. And um, when you think about things like COVID, those are very important things to think about. So we'd love to see a little more analysis of that variable. Finally, they provided a lot of details on the ways that neighborhood context may shape physical and mental health, but more analysis would be very informative. So let me get to some of the questions. Next slide, please. The unique contribution of this study, in my mind, is how they've evolved from, in the previous studies, looking at fear into a more positive view of that personal safety as associated with occupation and neighborhood safety and quality. Um, and so they have in figure 18, um, a very interesting way that they're looking at different ways that occupations experience different types of um, mental violence and threats, discrimination, harassment, for instance, versus physical threats, including occupational hazards in, in, as part of their work. So one question to the study authors is, how do those match up to the occupations, um, whether they are essential workers? Are they both essential and feeling unsafe? And how would the correlations between safe occupation and physical and mental health differ if you considered separately the first four mental stress items versus the second four, which focus more on physical dangers and threats? So the next slide, please. So now let's go to that intersection. Remember from the, the graph, I, the figure I showed you with the community resources here and the personal resources of the immigrant over here, this is where this study has a real potential to help us understand how that personal sense of safety and security intersects with neighborhood safety. So they found that high quality neighborhoods are the ones which rank low on the indicators of noise, crime, um, safety, and high on green space and public transport. So in figure 28, which they didn't show, it shows that the immigrants in these higher quality neighborhoods had fewer physical or mental health concerns. So the question to go back to the study authors is how does that match up with the individuals who live in these different communities, recognizing, of course, the sample size is small. It's just something to really, really think about is those, how individuals feel safe within communities that also feel safe or don't feel safe. Next slide, please. So another major question um, was in how, the immigrants' characteristics affected their lives and health during the COVID pandemic, because of course the study was done during the 
the COVID pandemic and Brooklyn and Queens are neighborhoods with high COVID infection and death rates. So immigrants in Brooklyn and Queens may not fare well against COVID. They have higher rates of essential workers among immigrants in these neighborhoods, which an earlier study by CMS did document. Immigrants in these communities may have social and economic disadvantages that make it harder for them, and they have just documented that. But some of the things that come up in this study are whether these usual disadvantages actually were influential in them staying healthy. Next slide, please. So the next question is on the intersection of COVID and other fears and discriminations experienced by immigrants trying to stay healthy. So it would be interesting if they could comment further on the study's findings regarding delays in seeking needed treatment due to fears of entering overwhelmed healthcare facilities during that. And did it vary by neighborhood or by their immigration status? And to what extent were those who delayed seeking care during COVID also experiencing discrimination while seeking any health care? Last question on the next slide. Gender and health status. Now, the majority of the respondents in this survey were, in fact, women. And we also know from a lot of the work that I've done in my studies here and others is that there are gender differentials in how um, men versus women access and use healthcare. So I'm just wondering whether the, the study authors have thought about the extent to which their findings have been influenced by the gender distribution of the survey respondents. So that's it for me in terms of questions. It was a, you know, a very interesting report. I think I read it through it three times and I still don't think I've digested everything that's in there. And I highly recommend to everybody listening that they get a copy of the report and read it carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to our next guest speaker. Um, and that's going to be Rishi Soon. And he will provide us with his perspective as a New York City government official and discuss how the government can use this report and its findings to implement and build on policies and programs and public health work. So please, Rishi, go ahead. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I wanna uh, thank you all for being here and thank Vicki and Jacqueline for uh, summarizing the report and for Sally for setting up um, some of the questions particularly related to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which I wanna address um, as uh, a part of the city health department and speak to you a little bit about uh, what the role of these types of report and this, this report in particular and this research in particular is in informing our work in, in public health practice. Uh, it, will, um, it was laid out very clearly already, all of the um, things that we know about immigrant health in terms of health care and health services and health care access, that um, immigrants tend to utilize fewer health services and report more on uh, unmet health care needs. And these are issues that have only been exacerbated during the pandemic, particularly in some of the neighborhoods that we're uh, talking about today and addressing um, that were addressed in this report. So early on in, in the pandemic, the New York City Health Department uh, committed to implementing uh, an equity action plan, uh, recognizing that the while COVID-19 was a new disease, uh, it was actually impacting people in ways that are quite familiar to us, that the devastation was familiar. It was seen in Latino and Black and low-income and immigrant communities more so than in others. And as has already been um, uh, brought up, the uh, part of the reason for this is that immigrants are disproportionately represented, not just in the workforce in New York City, but also in a term that all of us have become so accustomed to over the last two and a half years, the essential workforce, and that immigrants being uh, a disproportionate part of what we call essential workers, um, it put them at higher risk, as, as did many other um, uh, uh, factors related to the pandemic and the environment, but also importantly, the healthcare access disparities. And so as a part of this equity action plan, which really centered our COVID response for the last now more than two years, uh, we committed as a city health department to focus on uh, messaging and on engagement with both community partners and healthcare partners. Um, and uh, every step of the way since then, uh, including when our vaccination campaign as a city began 
uh, when uh, on re issues related to testing and now related to COVID-19 treatment or therapeutics, um, we need to recognize that certain neighborhoods and communities have been harder hit, continue to be harder hit because of structural disinvestment and racism, um, and that there are things that we need to do as a city government and as a city health department to lead the way in um, providing more and more uh, engagement with these communities and resources to make sure that we reverse um, these, these outcomes over time. And so I want to just provide a few examples of um, what this report really provides us with in terms of what we can implement in policy and practice. Uh, first, in terms of the community-based organizations that we have partnered with over the course of the pandemic, but long before that as well, this report really provides us with a lot of information on a more micro level about which neighborhoods to focus on for which issues related to health and social services. Community-based organizations and community-based healthcare partners provide such um, critical services and play such an important role in our safety net. Uh, in, in New York City. And so um, this really can help inform us as it had, as this type of information has over the course of the vaccination campaign, which uh, we would say would not have been as successful as it was uh, since it started if it weren't for the work of our community-based partners, including community-based healthcare partners. Uh, the second uh, piece of work that this can really help uh, us um, uh, uh, design and, and target um, in terms of uh, where we're rolling out this information and, and campaigns is, um, is related to um, some of uh, just a couple examples of a couple of campaigns that have run over the past several years. First, related to health insurance, the city uh, first started running what is now called the Get Covered campaigns in 2014 at the beginning of the um, implementation of the health insurance marketplace coming out of the Affordable Care Act. And those placements of ads, whether in subways or bus shelters or barber shops or other places, um, are, are strategic based on data that we have, but also data that's provided to us as a city on uh, not just insurance rates, though that's a really important factor, but also um, unmet healthcare need and other healthcare access indicators that go beyond insurance that are particularly important for the immigrant and the undocumented immigrant population. More recently, we had a campaign that was called Support Not Fear, which as Sally alluded to, was related, related to some of the policies under the previous federal administration, no, most notably perhaps public charge, which led to a chilling effect, which has been well documented both by CMS uh, and by the city and others um, on uh, what that did to healthcare service utilization and other service utilization to which many immigrants are entitled. Um, and that campaign was, um, was, was specifically targeted at telling people that you can still get services in New York City um, without fear of um, uh, enforcement from federal immigration authorities, but placing that in certain neighborhoods and zip codes is really important. Um, turning specifically to uh, COVID resources, we are in real time right now we're using this types of information and this data to, uh, to inform some of our ongoing COVID response related to testing and at-home test kits and COVID vaccines and um, mobile units for, um, for vaccines and, and, and for the vaccination campaign. And importantly, um, moving beyond COVID and expanding beyond COVID, recognizing that many, many New Yorkers, including immigrant New Yorkers, have fell be have fallen behind on their ex on their primary care needs and their preventive care needs uh, over the course of the pandemic, and we have a lot of catching up to do. And in in order to target some of those messages, um, we need to really know where the gaps are in services, um, so that we can uh, convince people to get back into regular care, um, whether it's uh, related to uh, COVID-19 or just catching up on your important primary and preventive care. Um, and finally, um, over the course of the uh, pandemic, but particularly in the early days, um, there was a number of resource guides that came out, not just from the city health department, but from our partners at Health and Hospitals, at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, that were related to emergency support um, and emergency um, uh, food, for example, or education services, healthcare services, other social services. And those resource guides, which are available on our websites, um, played, a, um, played a really important role in getting resources in, in a very short period of time um, to people who may have um, lost their health insurance, lost their job, um, been other in, um, impacted in other ways directly related to health or their families may have been impacted 
particularly in the early days of the pandemic. Um, but a lot of those resources remain really critical, uh, specifically to our most marginalized uh, communities and in particular marginalized immigrant communities. And so we look forward at the city health department uh, to, 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 to looking uh, more closely at this data and to, uh, and to using it to inform not just our COVID response, but our public health work and our healthcare access work going forward in partnership um, with others in government and in community-based organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Now we're going to turn it over to Becca Telsack, who will give a perspective on how community-based organizations are responding to the situation and partnering with the government. So Becca, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this report. Thank you for inviting me uh, here to speak today. I, so I'm here with Make the Road New York. Uh, we are a community-based organization. We are a membership-based organization with over 25,000 members across our five uh, sites. So we are located in Brooklyn and Bushwick um, and Jackson Heights, Staten Island, and also Long Island and Westchester. Um, so, you know, two of our main neighborhoods are actually neighborhoods that have been part of this report in Bushwick, and we also work very closely in Corona and Jackson Heights. So this report resonates a lot with kind of the communities we work with. Um, we work predominantly with um, immigrant and working class communities across those neighborhoods, do a lot of organizing and policy work, and also provide direct services. Um, and so, you know, just to say a lot of the disparities, the health disparities mentioned in this report really resonate with what we hear and see every single day from our community members. Um, you know, to highlight a few things, I think we, you know, we hear every day of kind of lack of access to health insurance is one of the biggest barriers that our members say um, is, is contributing to a lot of the health disparities they, they experience. Um, lots of that has to do with not being eligible due to their immigration status. Um, I could talk more about, about that in a minute. Um, again, kind of some of the, the, the priorities that were mentioned by, by immigrants really resonate with us as an organization connected to the cost, ability to see providers while you know, during hours where, where, where they can, when they have to deal with childcare and other needs. Um, so we hear a lot of that, about that from our, our community members as well. Um, and then just emphasizing that undocumented immigrants in particular just have a whole other level of um, disparities and challenges that they, that they experience. Um, we should start mentioning this as well, but we really did see that the pandemic ex exacerbated and really brought to light a lot of the inequities and disparities that we have no always known um, existed within these communities. Um, you know, we were seeing our members were either losing their jobs at very high rates, struggling to put food on the table, couldn't make ends meet at all, um, or were, and then also were the ones who weren't eligible for any form of government relief in the beginning um, before we had kind of the excluded worker fund created a year later um, at the state level, um, or they were the ones who were the essential workers, as we've mentioned already, kind of continuing to work at the forefront, um, delivery workers, construction workers, um, keeping kind of our city and state functioning. Um, and so we, you know, like community-based organizations really have been at the forefront of a lot of this stepping in to really make sure we are providing the support um, as needed, both on the policy side, but also on the direct service side um, to address a lot of these issues um, and have like deep connections and relationships with these communities. Um, we, you know, Make the Road, for example, we are, I mentioned this, we're a membership-based organization in those neighborhoods. We use a Promotorda community health worker model, kind of similar to what Sally was mentioning. Um, we have what we call promotoras, but also we have community health workers that we train, we run a training program, um, and also help work very closely with them. They're community members that we hire to really be that bridge between kind of the community and healthcare and government, um, helping people navigate the complex systems, accessing the services that they need, um, and are really folks who are really trusted within the communities. Um, I've heard kind of the public charge term come up a lot on this, on this call, and we really see and continue to see kind of lots of questions um, from immigrant communities in particular coming, asking kind of... A, if they can and should enroll in benefits, still being scared to enroll, um, even though we do have kind of a different, we've reverted back to kind of the original 1999 guidance are no longer under the Trump rule, um, but still there's a lot of questions and concerns. Um, but we did see, and we did some research organizationally around this um, during the Trump administration. And we did actually see that with having a permit or our trusted community member being the one to communicate directly um, with these folks who come in who are saying they're scared to apply for benefits, we actually did not see a decrease in enrollments and benefits across our organizations, um, because I think having someone who you trust, you can talk to, who can answer those questions, um, makes, such, makes such a huge difference and really helps community members really understand kind of what the impact could be um, and, and helps clarify some of their concerns. Um, we, you know, other thing to mention, like we obviously partner very closely with government and a lot of our projects, you know, we as a community organization, along with many other of our partner community-based organizations do benefit enrollment directly, right? We enroll people in in health insurance, in SNAP, we provide directly legal services. Um, we were very involved in the creation on the policy side of NYC CARE, 
Um, and then now are very much involved in implementation in terms of doing outreach education directed. It looks like Becca is having some technical issues. So um, until she's back up, we can um, move on to some of the questions from the audience. Um, so the first question is, do you have any data on whether more years spent in the U.S. as a foreign-born individual correlates with improved access to healthcare? And I'll just present that to all of the speakers right now before we get back to Becca. We do have that data. Um, and the quick answer is we didn't uh, analyze it in this report. However, um, something that came uh, came about before this call is, are you going to do more with this data? And the short answer is, there's a lot that could be done with this data that ha we haven't done already. So uh, the data is there that we haven't analyzed. And I think Becca's back. I am so sorry. The challenges of Zoom and internet, I just lost my internet connection. Um, I am so sorry. I'm not sure when I cut off. Um, but I was basically just saying kind of the connection of community-based organizations providing, um, you know, building deep relationships with community members. We were very involved in NYC CARE, um, a direct access program, which has been talked about a lot, um, both on the um, creation policy side, but also in helping people directly enroll in, enroll in the program. Um, and so really community-based organizations serve a real need by connecting very closely to government and helping encourage folks to enroll in benefits. I'm just gonna turn my video off, which may help. Um, yes, great, yeah. okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just gonna video just to make sure I don't cut off again. Um, we, you know, I think we, um, one thing, another thing to mention, obviously, um, just to move quickly to policy recommendations, this was mentioned before, but we make the road New York um, co-leads the coverage for all campaign working to expand health insurance coverage to everyone regardless of immigration status. But basically really quickly to wrap up on policy recommendations, um, Make the Road co-leads the Coverage for All campaign, which was mentioned as one of the policy recommendations to expand health insurance coverage to everyone regardless of immigration status. And we see that as one clear way to make sure we are addressing some of these inequities that, that exist um, at a structural level. Um, and then also making sure that we fully fund the NYC CARE program, which was mentioned, um, and really funding community-based organizations to continue to be the ones doing the outreach and education, making sure that people really understand what it is, aren't scared of it, know that it's not potentially a public charge risk, um, and really having community-based organizations as those trusted messengers doing a lot of that outreach and education for programs such as um, NYC CARE. And I was looking at kind of hearing, you know, seeing some of the results of the surveys where it says some people do not really know what NYC CARE is, they may not know what Thrive is, what Action NYC is. I think there's still a lot of education that needs to happen. I think there's also a lot of folks who don't, who know what it is, but don't actually know the term. And so they will say, yes, I go to Elmhurst Hospital and I have access to my primary care doctor, but may not know that the reason that they can do that in a seamless way is because of NYC CARE. And so I do think there's a lot of education just in terms of the naming of it too, just to note, just I think people do actually know what it is, but may not know how to use it, how to access it, or connect it back to certain programs. Um, and then, yeah, and finally, I just think, you know, community organizations and government are well positioned to make sure that we continue to do um, outreach material development in multiple languages. Um, and I think making sure that, 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 that community-based organizations receive sufficient funding to be able to do all that outreach and education is essential. So obviously we, you know, our folks, like we have staff who are connect, you know, Permathorta CHWs connected to the communities and are, and are well positioned to do that. I think community-based organizations oftentimes do not have sufficient funding to do all the outreach and education that, that is needed um, and targeted in the communities that, that need it most. Um, and I apologize again for my internet coming in and out. Hopefully you got most of it. <laughs> no worries, Becca. And thank you for your insightful presentation. And thank you to all of the speakers for their presentations as well. So we are um, out of time right now, but um, I, I will present just one more question to the speakers. And that is, uh, do you think access to mental health care is connected to individual's cultural background in any way? I'll answer that question. I thought that was a very insightful question to the, the person who asked it. Um, when I presented the barriers to healthcare, 
uh, the question was asked to those who reported needing the health care and not receiving it. So those who at, uh, at were asked the question, why did you not receive it, had already reported needing it but not receiving it. So those who thought they, who didn't report, didn't report not receiving it, um, perhaps they just didn't think they needed it at all and that was the cultural reason. So whether there could be bias in that self-reporting Yes, is the answer. There could be uh, in the same way um, there's there's barriers to people not receiving health care uh, at, at all. Um, however, um, still the reason that people, uh, you know, reported not receiving health care, you know, fear of stigma is still a reason that those who don't receive health care could report not wanting to receive it. Many people don't, you know, seek out health care because of fear of stigma. So I still believe that the gaps are there between the reasons people are reporting it, namely lack of insurance and co prohibitive costs um, are, I think, even in regards to measurement, any measurement error due to bias, I believe were overwhelmingly higher than any, um, uh, than, than any like error that would be reported there. Um, so yes, the fact that there could be people who's just, think they don't need any mental health care, perhaps that is there, it, it's hard to know. But, um, you know, I think that uh, even, even so among those who said they needed care and couldn't get it, the reason was, was cost and lack of insurance or inability to take time off of jobs, which as we heard from many are those essential jobs that people are working. So um, you can read more about it in the report, which is coming out this week. And, and thank you so much to everybody for attending, to our speakers, um, to our, our funders, to the people who reviewed this report, and especially to all the community-based organizations, clinics, um, who helped us get the word about, about this study, city organizations uh, who have just been fantastic in helping us out, reviewing, editing, the CMS staff. Uh, everybody has been so wonderful in making this study possible. So. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Melissa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, so we are out of time. So thank you for some concluding remarks, Jacqueline. Um, and everyone, please stay tuned uh, for a report that will be released very soon so you can see some more details that were discussed today. Thank you all and have a good evening. <laughs>